Hi, in this video we're going to review many of the key things related to the 2020 report to the nations. This is a global report of fraud that is reported for an 18 month period prior to the uh, publication of the report. The study is done every other year by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. And so let's take, go deep in and uh, take a look at some of the key statistics that uh, apply to what we're learning in class. So just a little bit about the cases uh, that are t used in this in this report. Uh, as you can see from this chart, it, we have a map of all the different areas that the U.S. and Canada make up about 46 percent of the reported cases and that's about 895 cases. Just a reminder, this is only cases that re were reported to the organization by certified fraud examiners. It does not include, in fact, it is very far from every single case. So the U.S. and Canada is at 46%. The Sub-Saharan and Africa is at 15%. Asia is at 10 And the rest of the world is at less than 5% or less than 10% each. I'm sorry about that. So this is looking at the types of occupational fraud committed. In our last chapter, we talked about the three, briefly talked about the three types of fraud, asset misappropriation, which is basically stealing an asset, cash, inventory, or other physical assets, corruption, more bribery, and financial statement fraud. We can see that in the occupational fraud, asset misappropriation is committed much more frequently than the others at 86% versus 10% for financial statement fraud. But the amount per case is significantly lower. It is at approximately 100000 for asset misappropriation and up to almost over 900000 for financial uh, statement fraud. So a lot of times if a fraudster is committing fraud, they're committing more than one type of fraud. So this Gantt chart shows that a large percent commit asset misappropriation only at 53%, but many of them overlap at 26% of the cases were asset misappropriation and corruption. And then corruption only at 11 and financial statement fraud is only 2%. But we seem to hear more about that because it's what makes the front page because it's usually done at an executive level, as we'll see in a minute, versus lower levels and the financial impact is big. So this is just a bar chart showing uh, how long a fraud lasts and how long, how much the losses are. And it's pretty, seems pretty, you know, appropriate that the shorter cases, uh, which were uh, less than six months, had losses of less, about $50,000. Whereas the lot, the frauds that took place over five years or more had more, much more significant losses up to about 740,000. And in between, we're kind of on a fairly linear slope there. So just looking at the types of frauds and how long they last, we can see that there are several frauds that on average last approximately 24 months. These are a lot in accounting types of areas. So payroll, uh, disbursements, check and product uh, payment tampering, all definitely in accounting as well as financial statement fraud and employee reimbursements and billing. Then some of the other areas of fraud, such as uh, cash larceny, corruption, uh, skimming, non-cash, are, are, are all much shorter. So 
So the typical median loss per month. So we're looking at really velocity here. How fast is somebody committing fraud? Financial statement fraud is but the fastest. So on a monthly basis, financial fraud, financial statement fraud is nearly $40,000 a month. Keep in mind, this is all sizes of companies. We're not just talking the larger WorldCom or Enron type funds because that is frauds because that's significantly larger. Then it's followed by corruption at 11000 a month, and then it goes down from there. But we can see that financial statement fraud on a monthly time frame is significantly more than any other type of fraud. I know we talked about this in an earlier our accounting information systems class, but what are the methods that an occupational fraud is usually detected? Well, the number one is tip. So some type of tip that comes in, and that's at 41%. Our next highest is internal audit. And actually, this has moved up from some previous reports that was further down at 15%. Then we have management review, I like this, by accident, 5%. And much lower, we have external audit. So by accident exceeds external audit, which is there at 4%. And 1% comes through uh, from confession. But So the number one thing to keep in mind here is the importance of establishing a whistleblower hotline or other ways for somebody to report fraud. Out of those who report fraud, half of those come from a fellow employee. Then 27% from a customer, anonymous, and vendor, and other. But the largest portion of people who uh, report fraud are fellow employees. So this I found kind of interesting, this bar chart. Uh, it compares the detection method. So how did you find out about the fraud and what was the loss? So if it gets down to the police being notified, those losses were over nearly a million dollars at 900 and they lasted at least two months. Confession was a, a lot less loss of 225, but 17 months. And you can see it goes down there by accident, external audit. But if it's getting to the police, it seems like it must be, it is a seri more serious fraud. And note that the first three there are considered what we call passive detection methods. So are notified by police, confession, and by accident are more passive versus the ones that are least effective, the active detective methods, audit, controls, management review, are the least effective or have or catch the smaller crimes. I should, shouldn't say the least effective. They catch the smaller crimes, the shorter duration, and the less dollar amount than those with the larger, uh, the more passive. And that kind of makes sense. If you have good controls and good audit, you're going to catch it faster, thus lower dollar amounts. So who did the whistleblower immediately report to? And this is showing that the direct supervisor is the first line of defense. Now, of course, if you're doing the whistleblowing, you need to know that your supervisor is not involved in the potential crime. Otherwise, um, you're just showing your hand. So that's always the tricky point with whistleblowing. And I know we talk about, we're going to talk about that a little bit throughout uh, the course as well. Next is other, uh, a fraud team, internal audit, and an executive. So there's a quite a variety here, but really the first line defense is the direct supervisor in most of these cases. So what types of organizations are affected by fraud? Well, in this bar chart, we can see that private companies have the greatest loss and the highest percentage of occupational fraud. Then public companies, government, and nonprofit. So 
private companies are probably one of the higher because maybe a little bit more lack of controls. Um, and actually, if you remember from Ryan Loma, that was a private company and the owners were kind of like, whatever, just as long as the bank doesn't know information and kind of that secretive attitude that was a little bit now, and this is not all private companies, of course, uh, kind of contrib contributed heavily into the opportunity that he has. So public companies are more strenuously audited, uh, also contributing uh, audits can also besides detecting crime can also be a bit of a deterrent. If I think my crime is going to be discovered, I'm going to be a little less apt to probably commit fraud uh, unless that, you know, undeterred portion of the fraud hexagon really comes in. And I think that's probably not going to be everybody on that. And then government of, you know, in your, one of the cases we'll talk about later was uh, is the Washington DC fraud uh, with property taxes. That's a prime example of a government fraud. So just a little bit about size and actually this kind of surprised me a little bit. Well, actually, no, um, you know, it's actually pretty even between the different sizes of companies, at least on percentages of cases. The smaller companies at 26, you know, 10,000 at 25 in the two categories right there in the middle. But the companies that lost the most per case were the smallest companies. They lost about $150,000 per incident versus the larger companies over with 10,000 or more employees lost about 140. And the two categories in the middle, a decent amount less. All right, this slide just shows a box for each of the different types of industries out there and gives the number of cases in the median loss. And I don't expect you to, you know, know all this, but some interesting trends here, or at least what I thought. Um, in mining, we have a median loss of 475. That is the highest of all the industries. And they had 26 cases, uh, which is kind of, big for uh, the number of cases, I would think. Uh, the next largest is construction with 80 cases, so quite frequent compared to the mo many of the industries. Um, as far as industries that have the highest number of cases, that would be banking. So they had 386 cases total, uh, but only a median loss of 100,000. And if you think about it, banking is kind of ripe with opportunity with the fact that, you know, they have a lot of cash and they have a lot of uh, possible opportunities if there is a lapse in controls. So just a little bit of high level of some of the trends, more of interest than a, a point for memorization. So, of course, companies are not wanting to have fraud committed. So they're putting in controls in place. Um, so this looks at some of the controls that were in place, at least from the uh, aspect of companies that had frauds reported against with them. The first one, uh, the main control is an external audit of financial statements. So that does act as a bit of a deterrent, as I said, but it, you know, it is the biggest control, even though we just saw that it really wasn't the most effective in kept, you know, in catching fraud. And if you think about it, that makes sense. External auditors have a large range for materiality. So they're not going to catch things in a large Fortune 500 company, for example, of a hundred thousand or less, or that's going to be a little bit more by accident than their procedures. Um, now, you know, they, they will catch some of this, but they're looking for more financial statement fraud than the asset misappropriation just by nature of their work. Code of conduct was up there at 81%. That's the next highest one. And I always wonder how effective this is. I mean, Enron and WorldCom all had, you know, first of all, the largest frauds ever, but they also had a code of conduct. So I think it goes beyond having that written policy of a code of conduct. I think it's more a code of conduct combined with 
that tone at the top of your executives talking about ethics and doing business right are probably a bigger factor than a code of conduct, but they do go hand in hand. Um, next for anti-fraud control is internal audit, uh, management of certification, which they're certifying the financial statements and their internal control. Um, you know, I find it interesting that only 64% of the companies have a hotline, given that that is the most common way to com detect fraud. Uh, fraud training, employee, so just going down, rewards for whistleblowers is also the lowest. And you would think, given the fact that whistleblowing and tips are the most effective way to catch, most common way to catch fraud, that that would maybe be a little higher. So just a little bit about this chart, you know, so it's showing companies that uh, what their average loss was. If they had a code, for example, a code of conduct or each of these anti and, you know, what the average loss was without. And if these controls are in place, it looks like an average loss was about a hundred thousand. If the controls were not in place, the, the median loss was much higher. For example, for code of conduct, companies lost about a, that had a code of conduct and had a fraud had a loss of about a hundred thousand. Those that did not have a code of conduct had a loss that was double that. So kind of here we're going to get into some of the HR procedures and then uh, some information about an average perpetrator. So one of the questions was, was a background check done before hiring? Um, and it's about half and half, 52 yes and 48 no. Then the subsequent question is, did the background check reveal any existing red flags? 13% of those said yes. So 13% of the 52 said yes and still hired the individual. And I know that's always a sticky thing because you can believe in second chances, but, um, there's also guarded caution and, you know, you might be able to keep in mind what position you put somebody in with a red flag. You know, I went put them in the treasure or high access to cash type of situation. So just a little bit of what types of background checks were run. Employment history was the most common at 81. Criminal checks next. Only a little over half check references. Uh, and 38% check credit cards. So um, you are able to check a somebody's credit report if they're in a position that will handle uh, valuable assets or cash. All right, so a little bit more about the perpetrator. Um, what level of authority are they committing? And 41% are employees versus 35 manager and 20% executive owner. So that's the large, the number of cases, but the median loss is significantly higher for owner executives than for right, uh, non manager employees. So 600,000 for owner versus 600 for 60 for the employees. So an employee, non-manager employee, typically has a, a fraud scheme that is 12 months, a manager at 18, and an owner executive at 24 months. So twice as long, which also contributes to the larger dollar amount. So this is how long has the perpetrator been at the company? A very small number of cases are for individuals at the company less than a year. The majority are for individuals there from one to five years. And that makes sense. It, you need a little time to determine what the opportunity is in order to be able to commit a fraud. So that's at 46. Um, and then it's about even with between six and 10 and greater than 10. Um, Sometimes the larger ones are creating the, you know, more on financial statement fraud 
the you know who've been there the longer or they're moving up to a management position which sometimes does create more opportunity <clears throat> All right, in this chart uh, of the slides, it's just showing, you know, how large of a fraud for each of the functional areas and based on also the number of frauds. So, of course, executive and upper management is kind of up here in the scatter plot with some of the highest frauds and the more frequent. Down on the frequent side, but maybe not quite as high, is accounting and operations, and then a low percentage of fraud, but the highest dollar amount is actually the board of directors. And then there's some a, a lot of other ones kind of in the lower left-hand quadrant of the, you know, with a scatter plot of the number of fr frauds versus the dollar amount. <clears throat> All right, a little bit, so our fraudster is going to be a management, accounting, or operations a lot of the times, and that makes sense based on opportunity. So how does the gender compare? Well, in this report, 72% uh, of the frauds were commi committed by men and 28 by women, and men had also the larger. Now, keep in mind, this is worldwide. Because in a later chart, this one, I want to show you that in the U.S., that distribution is a lot closer. 59% men, men and 41% women compared to worldwide, 72 versus 28. So that gap, and that is very consistent with all the fraud cases I'm reading. In fact, uh, the video that the movie you're going to watch next um, or you know, later this week is one of the largest governmental crimes was a woman um, in your book one third you know just in the first chapter one third were women so there I'm not surprised that it's much closer there than anywhere else in the world so age of our perpetrators so our general age the highest ones are in that 30 to 45 range um, but the largest dollar amount frauds are committed by people uh, that are 55 and older. So the more frequent frauds by those in their late 30s, early 40s, but those 55 and older are committing the highest dollar volume. Education. And this makes sense because you need to be competent as we talked about with the fraud uh, hexagon. So 49% have graduate degrees and 15% of those postgraduate. The rest have high school or just some university. Also with the more education, we have the higher losses. So how many perpetrators are committing the fraud? One. Um, for half of them are committed by one perpetrator, but they have the smallest losses. And a third are committed by three or more. And that's where we have some of the largest losses. Do the perpetrators have prior fraud convictions? 89% um, have never been charged or convicted. That does not mean they have not committed fraud before. That means they have not been legally charged. 7% uh, are repeats and have been charged but not convicted, which means if it's a repeat, there's a high probability they committed the first one. And 4% had prior convictions. What about other discipline? So 86% have not been, were never punished or never terminated. Eight previously punished and eight previously to terminate it, terminated. So what are our red flags? So what would a fraud investigator look for? And the number one is not surprising and actually it goes with probably number two, living beyond their means and financial difficulty are probably the two largest ones. Uh, 
close association with vendors and customers that allows for some collusion a little bit more easily. Um, no red flags at 15%. Control issues is also up there. So a great example is a fraud that took place here in Cedar Falls, Iowa. So the CEO was very controlling. Uh, the Paragon Falcon or the Paragon Financial Group um, was located here in Cedar Falls. They were a financial company. And the CEO of the company insisted on doing the bank recon every month. Not usually a typical task of a large financial, you know, for the CEO of the typical financial. And so it was part of that was a control. The other thing he did was hired individuals around him who were not experts in their area. For example, the CFO, the person who deals with all the financial statements, did not have an accounting degree. In fact, it was something completely far from account. It wasn't even a business degree. And that was part of the control nature of that crime. Um, if you're able to control somebody, if you can, you know, show that you know more, well, if they're a completely different major and never had an accounting class, that would not be very difficult. Um, irritability, suspiciousness, defensiveness. So some of these things are more attitude types of, um, items. So other non-fraud related misconduct. So why else have they been, you know, called into HR? So bullying or intimidation, uh, 20%. Uh, by the way, only 45% have had other issues besides the fraud. So, uh, excessive absenteeism or tardiness, tardiness, excessive browsing. So some of these things, bullying, and that kind of goes back to the control that is pretty typical in fraudsters as well. 42% of fraudsters had some type of negative HR experience during their fraud. Uh, this includes poor performance evaluations, fear of job loss or at 13 and 12, denied a promotion, actual job loss or cut and paid. So all these things kind of help build that justification that we saw, talked about in the fraud triangle and some of the other models. So how do our fraudsters get punished? 66% are terminated. They were no longer, 11% have already left the company and it was discovered after they left. Uh, probation, it doesn't talk, what it doesn't talk about is how many were criminally charged, um, which is another interesting thing. And here it kind of shows just some trends over the years of why organizations are not referring cases to law enforcement. So um, I find it interesting that between the reports from 2012 to 2018, there's quite a jump in that uh, companies that felt that their internal discipline was sufficient, that, you know, terminating the employee was sufficient, that they didn't need to charge criminally. And that may be because it's a lower dollar value crime. Um, but charging anybody who gets, who's found to be guilty helps actually deter future frauds. Fear of bad publicity is was has been consistently there in the 30% range. Um, cost looks to be another factor as well. So this is a lot of information about some great trends that uh, for fraud. So think about how this could help a company. They can, you know, you don't want to stereotype, but you can look for these red flags and trends to know who is more likely to commit fraud. It gives you some good information about how frauds are caught and maybe which controls are more effective. So even though it is a very small sample of all the frauds committed, it is actually pretty helpful for a lot of companies to take a look at it and see how things are going in their own company.
So that concludes what we're going to talk about for the global report to the nations. And with that, have a great day.